Welcome, everybody. If you want, uh, if you're still coming in, please uh, uh, find your seats, and we'll get started. Uh, my name is Stephen Collis. I'm a law professor across the street and uh, the faculty director of the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center. Uh, we've, this event today is being hosted uh, jointly by the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center and the Asia Policy Program. So what I'd like to do is very quickly give a brief introduction to both of these, uh, the, both the, the program and the center, and then I will introduce our uh, distinguished guests and speakers. Um, first off, the, uh, the Asia Policy Program was established in 2021 as a joint initiative of the Clement Center for National Security and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. It addresses the region's increasing importance in global politics and American national security. The APP's mission is to foster research, dialogue, and education about policy-relevant developments and questions in the Indo-Pacific, including through speaker series uh, like this one today. The Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center is dedicated to advancing knowledge of the First Amendment and to fostering appreciation of its place in our legal system. The rights secured by the First Amendment include the liberties of religion, speech, and the press, as well as the freedoms to peaceably assemble and petition the government. Our center provides opportunities for deliberation about these rights and the controversies related to them through, among other things, conferences, scholarship, lectures, conversations, and debates. We also, incidentally, if you're a student, uh, provide a number of educational resources about First Amendment issues for students, both for undergraduates and graduate students. So if you have any interest in getting involved in the center's work, don't hesitate to reach out to me or some of our staff. Um, now what I'd like to do is introduce you to uh, our, our two speakers who are gonna have, uh, give the majority of the time, I'll turn the time over to them, and then we'll have a nice, robust, hopefully Q&A, and we've got a couple of, uh, of our undergraduate liaisons at the First Amendment Center who will be running microphones for folks when, you, when we get to the Q&A part. So first, let me introduce our guest, uh, whom we are hosting today. Nuri Turkel is an attorney, foreign policy expert, and rights advocate with nearly two decades of experience working in the intersection of law, business, government, and the human rights community. He specializes in corporate governance and regulatory compliance, national security, foreign policy, digital authoritarianism, and forced labor and supply chain risk issues. He is currently serving as the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom after being appointed as a commissioner by Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi in May 2020. He has testified before the U.S. Congress, speaking about Uyghur internment camps and advocating a legislative response to China's atrocities. His policy recommendations have been incorporated into U.S. laws and pending bills related to Uyghurs and China. As a rights advocate, he has led efforts to raise the profile of the Uyghur cause, previously as president of the Uyghur American Association, and now as chair of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, which he co-founded in 2003. He also advised past and president leadership of the World Uyghur Congress. He is a senior fellow at a Washington think tank, the Hudson Institute, where he works on U.S. foreign policy and national security issues. He is also a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. His policy-oriented essays have appeared in major publications such as Foreign Affairs, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Foreign Policy, Time, Newsweek, and USA Today. And he frequently provides commentaries on TV and radio programs, including CNN, the BBC, Radio Free Asia, Fox News, PBS, NPR, Al Jazeera, and France 24. In 2020, he was in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World list, and in 2021, he was listed as, as one of Fortune's 50 Greatest Leaders. In June 2021, he received the inaugural Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty. He holds a Juris Doctor and Master of Arts in International Relations degrees from American University. Could you all uh, give me a, help, help me welcome Nuri here to the stage. Nuri. Nuri will be joined today by uh, UT's own Professor Sheena Greitens. Sheena is an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT, where she directs the Asia Policy Program. She is a Jeannie Kirkpatrick Visiting Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and an associate in research at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Dr. Greitens' research focuses on American national security, East Asia, and authoritarian politics and foreign policy. Her first book, 
Dictators and their secret police, coercive institutions and state violence came out from Cambridge University Press in 2016 and received multiple academic awards. Her second book on authoritarianism and diaspora politics in North Korea is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press soon. Her work has appeared in academic journals and edited volumes in Chinese, English, and Korean, and in major media outlets, and she has testified before Congress on security and democracy in the Indo-Pacific. In 2017 and 18, Dr. Greitens served as the First Lady of Missouri, where she co-led the state's trade missions to China and South Korea and ran an interagency policy initiative that led to major legislative and executive branch reforms of Missouri's policies on foster care, adoption, and child abuse prevention. She holds a BA from Stanford University, an MPhil from Oxford, and a PhD from Harvard. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Greitens. So with that, we will turn the time over to uh, Nuri and Sheena to engage in a book talk about Nuri's latest book release regarding his experience in China. And then uh, when the time is appropriate, I will come back up here to uh, lead us in a Q&A. Nuri and Sheena. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. If anybody at any point has trouble hearing me, please, folks in the back, just wave or holler. Thank you. Um, well, it's really a, a pleasure for me to be able to welcome Nuri Turkle to this event today. I met Nuri several years ago um, through work on China's surveillance state in particular and its impact on human rights and freedom in Xinjiang um, and had the pleasure of testifying to the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom um, when Nuri was a, a commissioner there. So I have a long appreciation for his work and am really pleased to be able to have someone with his long expertise and commitment to princi principled advocacy for human rights um, join us here at, at UT. So Nuri, thank you for making the trip. Thank you so um, much. Thank and for, for spending your time with us today. Um, what I wanted to do is to give you a, a little bit of a chance to talk about, about the book that brings you here today. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a bit about um, what led you to write the book. And since not everyone here has, has maybe had a chance to read it yet, although it's a, it's a really compelling book and I would encourage everyone here to do so. Um, Please tell us, you know, what are the, the core ideas and messages that you wanted to convey in sharing the stories that are in the book with, with the world? So over to you to talk a bit about that to get us started. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor to uh, so sit next to you to have a conversation about important issues uh, that we've both been following. It's been a pleasure to follow you and learn from your expertise over the years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to thank my good friend, uh, Steve, for hosting me here uh, in the Center and our Asia Policy Program for organizing this uh, book event uh, so that I can share my stories, so that I can um, tell you the stories of the others uh, that may compel you to help to end the ongoing genocide in China. The reason that I wrote this book, I never thought about writing uh, a memoir this early in life. Um, but Starting 2016, uh, specifically since uh, this individual that you may have seen in the news uh, by the name Chen Zhengguo appointed as a party secretary uh, from Tibet to Xinjiang. Um, and I sense uh, intensification of their policy approaches, uh, starting from my own family. And then I, in the early 2017, I heard uh, university professors uh, Uyghur thought leaders, uh, community leaders, religious leaders, business leaders start disappearing. And then in April 2017, um, I, I read about this uh, draconian measure called de extremification measure uh, put in place by the local um, uh, the legislative body in, in, in Xinjiang. Uh, that foreign policy magazine uh, reported as 48, 48 ways to get into the uh, internment camps. And then uh, no, being somebody who was born in a re-education camp myself at the height of the uh, Cultural Revolution, I wanted to contribute to this conversation uh, through this book that this is uh, what has happened to the Uyghur people is not, is not something new. This has been happening over the years, as long as I can remember, starting from my own life. And I went to a media in 2018. I, I said that, well, <clears throat> this is essentially re-education 2.0. And at that time, we did not know much about it. 
So, so the, that, that was essentially the key uh, reason, the main reason that I wanted to share my personal story being born in a re-education camp and what my young mother at the time, she was barely 20 uh, years old, uh, went through while my father dragged into forced labor camp outside of the uh, city of Kashgar where I was born and raised. Uh, and I, I, I thought that this is something need to be told uh, because to most American people, uh, what is happening in China may come across as one-off, but this has been a systematic problem. And that's one reason. And then also, um, I thought that um, I owe to the Uyghur community uh, and those camp survivors, uh, victims, uh, that I need to help them to tell their story. So as I profiled in my book, I have interviewed um, most of the camp survivors, specifically the female camp survivors, to profile what kind of uh, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, psychological abuse uh, that they have gone through. And also wanted to um, uh, tell American people through this book um, that this is no longer another human rights crisis that American public or people living in liberal societies can ignore. As for my ultimate goal, uh, writing this book, in addition to those, those reasons, I feel that I have not been free, even though I'm an American citizen uh, and now a US official. I don't feel that I have been able to uh, escape the Chinese persecution. This is why my book carries the title, No Escape. Um, since I came to the United States in 1995, I have been only able to spend 11 months uh, with my late father and my mother. Uh, that can give you an idea how torturous, uh, costly my human rights work has been. And since 2004, I have not been able to see even my own mother. Uh, my father passed away in, in April uh, while I was on a trip to Uzbekistan as part of the U.S. delegation. I could not even attend my father's funeral, hold my mother and mourn with her because I've been sanctioned by China last December. Um, so with, with my freedom being granted by the U.S. government to me uh, through my asylum application, now citizenship, I cannot go to be with my mother, um, whom I have not seen for 18 years. Um, and I have to look over my shoulder when I do, do this kind of public speaking. So I want American people to know that even though uh, I'm an American citizen like yourself, uh, for most of you, I'm not free. And also using this book to make the American people, the readers, feel this is, is something that is, is related to them. So this is, not a, this is a reality that no one can escape. Uh, in light of the connection to broader national security, economic interests uh, in our relationship with communist China. So when you look at the consumer products, uh, we're talking about more than 80 global brands been implicated using slave labor. Uh, even solar panels that uh, we put on a roof uh, reportedly been made with slave labor. And also, we do know that uh, Chinese government using technology, uh, surveillance, uh, testing it out initially, and now uh, exporting the same uh, governance, uh, same control methods. So this is, this is affecting our lives. This is also about our global leadership as a country. This is about global justice and accountability. Uh, if you have signed on to international laws and treaties, we must fulfill our treaty obligation, in the case in point, the gen Genocide Convention. So using this title, I also wanted to um, make a connection to a broader audience that no one can escape this brutal reality. Thank you. I think the, having, having read the, the book, the stories that you relate are really compelling. And I was particularly struck by the inclusion of these specific stories about women's experiences in the camp system. I wondered if you could um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, we've seen reporting in the news about some of the, the policy changes that the Chinese government made that resulted in the, the expansion, dramatic expansion of um, the internment camp system, um, which is now estimated to have dragged in somewhere between one and three million people, I think, at the latest estimate. I wondered if you could um, talk a little bit for people who might not be as familiar with that 
what you heard um, from the stories of the people you interviewed, what the impact was on people actually living in, in Xinjiang. Because it's one thing to sort of read about it as a matter of policy. And one of the things that the book conveys so effectively is, is what the impact was on people's ordinary, everyday lives and how transformed and, and uprooted those lives were. So I wondered if, if you could reflect on that a little bit. Uh, just quickly, two thoughts to begin that um, a, a question needs a little bit more time to explain. The, the family time that the Uyghur people deserve, including my own family time, had been taken away from us. We're talking about families been broken. Like they have a slogan, break the lineage, break the roots, break the um, uh, connection. That is their policy. So they're specifically targeting Uyghur families, taking about 800,000 Uyghur children as reported in the New York Times to state-run orphanages, which, is, which they call boarding schools, in a way that the Chinese are also committing genocide against Uyghur children, uh, and also targeted attack on the Uyghur uh, women in particular through a forced sterilization and, and rounding, them, rounding them up and sending to the camps. In, 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 in some instances, sending Chinese cadres to their homes as a profile in a book uh, to monitor and surveil their lives, even communica- uh, spying on the, their communication with the children. Uh, in some instances, committing sexual violence against those vulnerable uh, women at their own place of residence. Um, that is what is happening there. So they broke the families as promised. They uh, effectively uh, disconnected the Uyghur uh, fathers from their children. I interviewed individuals uh, who are based in Turkey who recognized their children in the TikTok video messages, chanting pro-CCP slogan, sitting on the, the laptop of a cop who was the reason that this kid could not see his uh, family. Um, and because of the, the surveillance, uh, pervasive surveillance, the Uyghur families in China uh, deleted their foreign contacts um, starting 2018, including my own family, telling us not to call, not to return under any circumstances. As for the, the Uyghurs outside of, the, uh, outside of China, including those in the United States, uh, this has also happened extremely difficult uh, if you talk to any Uyghur uh, here at home or around the world, I travel a fair amount uh, doing public uh, events like this, uh, meeting with government officials, community leaders. It's just horrifying to hear their stories. And some, some instances they ask for my help to find out if their loved, loved ones who disappeared are still breathing. Uh, this includes some American citizens who are not comfortable going, to, going public because there will be uh, consequences if they go out and testify and call attention to their family members. The other thing is, is very, uh, it's, it's, it's very common in Uyghur communities, uh, a disappointment. Um, you may disagree in humanity in general. Uh, you know, people in a Uyghur community, especially in the Uyghur intellectuals, among the Uyghur intellectuals, as promised never again is very well known because Uyghurs study Jewish history way back. Even I studied Jewish history when I was in China. Uh, and, and, and that broken promise uh, and this genocide in its sixth year, still ongoing, except for the United States, most, most of the countries around the world have not even figured out what to do with it. And that had a huge, uh, a tremendous imp- effect in the mental health of the Uyghurs around the country, here at home and around the world, in, and particularly in Europe. So when you talk to them, you can see that there's something is wrong. Uh, in some instances, they are just burst, bursting into tears. Like, wh- what kind of? I mean, they even sometimes question the existence of God. Like, what? Why would have to we have to suffer this much? What have we done? These kind of questions come and comes up. And then, uh, close to home, uh, we have a significant number of Uyghur Americans, the American citizens, who have been affected by this. Uh, just one typical example, half of the Radio Free Asia reporters have family members been uh, sent to the camps, and they're American citizens, and they are working for American people, even though they're not directly employed by the U.S. government. They are government contractors. Even in their cases, our government has not been, have not been uh, government agencies, uh, both Republican and Democratic administration, been able to even obtain uh, a freedom of even one single individual. So... These kind of uh, disappointments, frustration, despair, 
created a huge mental health problem. So Uyghur people's mental health, mental well-being have been uh, se severely affected. One of the things that you and I have talked about previously is the, the analogy that, that the Chinese party state sometimes uses, that the Communist Party uses, of religious belief as a potential virus and the need to immunize, in, in their language, um, groups like the Uyghurs, religious minorities inside China, um, to avoid what they argue is a risk of extremism. But in many cases, what that means is intervening and preventing fundamental exercise of religious freedom, things like praying, going to a mosque, going um, to a, one of the things you describe in the book is going to a cemetery um, to visit the tombs of families. Um, and so the, this is the way that it's framed in a language of public health and prevention, um, but really intended to, to interfere with really fundamental religious belief and practice um, is really, uh, really striking. I wanted to ask you a, a little bit more about something that, that you touched on just a minute ago, which is the, the role of um, Uyghur families, family members, and activists who are abroad. Um, because, um, and I wanted to just ask you a bit about the what you see as the roles and the responsibilities of um, people like yourself and other people who've been exiled. In many cases, we've seen, um, for example, in the case of North Korean human rights, and especially the last, I would say, five, six years as it relates to, to Xinjiang, um, that members of the Uyghur community who have either voluntarily or involuntarily left yeah. their families and their homes in Xinjiang um, have become really powerful witnesses, providing firsthand testimony of what's happening um, and become representatives for those who, who cannot speak because they remain in, in China and have had to cut off communication with the outside world in the ways that you described. Um, but I wanted to ask you about how you, you know, your, your journey from when you arrived at the University of Idaho in um, 2004, I think, 1990, uh, 90, 90, 90, I'm sorry, 1995. 1995 was off a decade. <laughs> um, uh, when I was, I was actually living about 70 miles north of there at that point <laughs> and had no idea. Um, so, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about how your thinking on that question has evolved and what you see as the responsibility of people who are outside, um, outside of Xinjiang, outside of Kashgar, um, but and, and in many cases now cut off, but who feel some responsibility toward those who remain. Uh, before I address that important mm -hmm. question, I'd like to add um, a, a couple of uh, uh, points um, to that uh, uh, medical metaphor that the Chinese use. Um, you may wonder why this country that has an in intimate uh, economic relationship with the world, including our country, um, a rising power would commit this kind of uh, uh, crime, atrocities in a broad daylight. It has a lot to do with the way that they see the religious and ethnic identity. Uh, so when you look back when Xi Jinping came to power and in 2014, they announced the first national security strategy, they focused on two things, uh, foreign entanglement and any threat uh, that will hamper development or stability. That's the uh, term that they use uh, literally in every uh, major policy speech. For uh, the foreign entanglement, the foreign encirclement, the foreign religion, uh, specifically Christianity and uh, Uyghur Islam, has some connection to it. This is why they are so focused on these two particular religious groups uh, in recent years. On the other aspect, the, the threat, uh, societal threat, the future potential threat, they identify the, the, those Uyghurs uh, in particular, pious Uyghurs, were the Uyghurs who have um, a, a strong nationalistic sentiment, the Uyghur ethnic identity, through their professional career, writing, uh, speak, uh, being a, a professor at the university, academic life, or stage performance. Uh, Uyghurs are very artistic people. Uh, they write uh, poems, they recite um, poems in public events, gatherings. So that to the Chinese government is something that would potentially cause, um, or could be a reason for potential uh, uh, unrest or challenge. So they, uh, uh, they use that as, as, as a perceived threat, not an existing threat, 
as a way to do a preemptive policing. So that goes to the point that uh, Shina was making. So that's essentially the reason. It's not something that the Uyghur people uh, specifically have done something. Of course, there have been some violent incidents have been reported, which has not been independently verified. But that even, even that's the reason uh, that even if that kind of things could happen or would happen or has had happened, we should not uh, compelling the Chinese leadership in engaging in this kind of collective punishment. It does not justify. But the way that they see uh, ethnic background, religious practices as, as a th source of threat that need to be taken out before it spreads to the, the organs of the society, uh, compel the Chinese policymakers to uh, engage in today's genocidal acts. Um, the Uyghur community um, is relatively small in the United States, about 8,000 to 10,000. But they're very vocal and very effective. Uh, the, the one way I think the uh, success, uh, even in the face of this brutal regime, uh, the risks, personal risks, family risks, the Uyghur communities both here at home and, and around the world, in Europe in particular, have been very courageous. Uh, since 2017, there have been uh, a global lobbying effort, i.e. participate in some of it before I um, uh, take up the government uh, role, uh, lobbying the government, so including Australian, Canadian, uh, the UK, European Parliament. The Uyghurs are also very active at the UN in Geneva. And in the United States, the Uyghur populations are very uh, well educated. They know the system. And also, most of the Uyghurs live in Washington area. Uh, two things I think were very, very helpful uh, the way that the Uyghur community approach. One, try not to be political. Um, there's a lot of political domestic issues that everyone and all of us have opinion. Uh, I think one of the effective ways that the Uyghur community managed to have this many uh, political accomplishments in the United States is to stay out of uh, po politics try to keep it bipartisan, focus on the human rights campaign, uh, focus on uh, using the factual information, no exaggeration, no hyperbolic statements, and, and provide testimonies, build very close relationship with uh, uh, congressional staffers. Uh, those are the very effective. And also the one other way that I, I, I thought that uh, the Uyghur communities around the world did very well is to use the media, uh, including social media. Uh, I did not even think that this was possible in 2005 when I started writing op-eds myself. But now you see op-eds written by uh, Uyghur activists all around the world in European publication and US publication. You see them on TVs, panel discussions. The public education using media has also been very, very effective. And then most important thing, I think this is very uh, useful, even for policymakers in the previous administration, they, Get, that give a proper name to the atrocities, is, uh, was the willingness of the camp survivors to go public with their gruesome stories. Uh, most of them have been profiled in my book, except um, a, a few in Europe. Uh, that has been very effective. And also, um, one thing that cannot be ignored is the role of the Kazakh community in Kazakhstan. The, when you hear about these atrocities, oftentimes people rightfully focus on the Uyghurs, but the Kazakh community also been heavily influenced. So the, the Chinese claim that they're fighting against separatism does not really hold well. What kind of separatism are we talking about with the Kazakhs? Uh, we have uh, heard a substantial number of Kazakh population who even have a citizenship in Kazakhstan have caught up in this. There are about 200 Uyghurs who are Turkish citizens also caught up in this, spending time in, in the camp. So those Kazakhs who managed to leave China early on was critical in providing uh, factual information, personal testimonies and accounts uh, to help the world to see what is really happening. Actually, it worked better than the Uyghurs telling the story early on. There's, there's, there's a lot to be told, but the, the skepticism uh, kind of diminished with the Kazakhs going forward and testifying. So, so I, I am very pleased with the progress. Um, uh, the Uyghurs don't have a big PR firm or lobbying firm uh, or deep pocket uh, or person who writes a big check, but this has been just purely a good heart effort, uh, testifying, engaging, uh, go, uh, sharing stories in public. I think this can be 
good case for study, and specifically building, being able to build bipartisan coalition. When Congress um, considered the first Uyghur uh, bill, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, in May 2020, we had unanimous consent in the Senate. 406 members of uh, the House of Representatives voted yay. And then last December, when Congress uh, legislated uh, or considered uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, the same type of response, overwhelming positive response. And now we have two six, uh, administration, Trump and Biden administration, essentially taking the same position, uh, which is remarkable in today's toxic environment, specifically in Washington. Yeah, I think that is a testament to the effectiveness of some of the advocacy that, that you and your colleagues um, and the Uyghur community in the United States and globally has um, has been able to and One other thing is messaging strategy. That also been very, very effective. Can you talk a little bit about that? The, the, you know, the, uh, the messaging, um, there are a lot of uh, geopolitical aspects to what is happening to the Uyghurs, but the Uyghur activists have been very, very uh, uh, focused. For example, saying that, oh, today is my mother's birthday. I wish I can spend time with her. What kind of people will not agree with that? And then uh, an American a US born grandchild uh, show, uh, releasing a short video saying, when can I meet my grandparents? My grandfather has disappeared. Oh, by the way, he was a former uh, Chinese government official. So that kind of message really resonated short. Uh, it, 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 it's been so effective, the social media uh, use of the activists around the world. I think the tragic impact that these policies have had on families and family connections is really one of the things that's incredibly moving um, in the stories that, that I've heard you tell and, and seen in some of these social media posts as well as in the, the book itself. One of the things that also comes through very clearly is something that the United States government has warned about recently. Um, in fact, I think there was an indictment that became public this morning um, which is the increased use of what we call extraterritorial repression by the Chinese party state. And one of the things that I've been tracking recently under Xi Jinping's Global Security Initiative, but even before that, is actually the expansion of Chinese policing activity outside the borders of the PRC. So China has, in some cases, offered police assistance, established police liaison relationships, yeah. offered to provide training to foreign police officers in Southeast Asia and Central Asia, elsewhere in the world. Um, but a lot of the way that China approaches police activity is inherently political, as right. your book makes very clear. Um, and, and that doesn't change because the activity suddenly becomes internationalized. So I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, in, as both an advocate, a human rights advocate, and as someone who thinks about American policy in your yeah. role on the Commission yeah. um, on International Religious Freedom. What are the challenges that we need to think through, and what are some of the policies that we will need to be, be considering in the years ahead to deal with this growing challenge of extraterritorial repression? So the State Department has uh, a, a term, they call it uh, transnational repression. Uh, Secretary Blinken um, uh, issued statement and uh, imposed sanction, uh, visa ban on Chinese individuals, unnamed Chinese individuals, entities that have been engaging in transnational repression. The, the, some countries use different uh, terminologies. For example, Australians use uh, course of coercion. Uh, they have three C. You're aware of uh, John Garneau's invention of three C's, corrupt course of uh, corrosive. Uh, influence operation. This is a pandemic. Uh, this is this is a this is a, a global problem that we're dealing with. So the, the Chinese uh, 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 diplomatic community uh, they're also using like for example I shouldn't be. Um, uh, I was in Los Angeles to attend a big event and I, I there was two two Chinese uh, individual. Uh, one of them looked like a military guy uh, filming, uh, pic taking pictures of me. I don't know his identity, but this is very common. They go there and they try to scare you, try to affect your mental well-being. Uh, and, and, and also the other thing that they do, um, and I can talk about how they uh, uh, affect our freedom of speech in the United States. They also go uh, uh, and talk to... Uh, through WeChat app most of the time, uh, the 
the individuals whose family members have been taken to the camp. They say, you either work with us, uh, go around and report of the activities of the, uh, the activists, uh, or you will stay silent, don't say anything, don't talk about, don't testify. And there's, I'm talking about American citizens, US citizens, and they can't say anything in public because the consequences are so severe. If two family members have already been in the camp, if uh, non-compliance by this individual may result in third or additional members to be taken in the camp. So this is various, and then also the retaliatory actions. As I alluded earlier, for, for example, I can't get my mom, mother out of China. She has a family here in the United States, five grandchildren between me and my brothers. She cannot travel because of the China's retaliation, uh, holding her a hostage. And, 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 and also, this is one of the many stories that I hear. This is very common in the Uyghur community. And as for the, um, uh, the academic institutions, I'm so grateful that um, this school is hosting this event. This is very unusual. You may find it um, incredible. The hosting Uyghur-specific topics and events has been very rare. I can even count how many times that I went to speak at law schools in the United States. This simply because they are, uh, the universities are also very afraid of, or concerned of the Chinese pressure. In some instances, the Chinese consulate called the universities or the professors hosting events like this not to host. I have not dealt with it publicly yet, but I, I know it for a fact that the university professor has been pressured not to uh, engage in, in the prov provocative conversations uh, with respect to China. Uh, the, on the, the policy ground, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the problem with our system, this is not something that we were prepared or we have uh, got used to dealing with. So the US Congress is, is considering a legislation to deal with transnational repression. At the end of the day, this is a sovereignty issue. This is a free speech issue. If you cannot speak your mind in your own country, in the United States, then we have a serious problem. If you are an academic, if you're a professor, if you're worried about what the CCP or United Work Front Department in Beijing thinks about your work, then we have a serious problem. If you're a student, you worry about speaking your mind in your classroom because your fellow classmates may have an objection, uh, or objectionable view, or may have opposing view, then we have a problem. So this is a systematic problem. It started with the um, targeted attack on the Uyghurs, but now it's becoming bigger, a bigger concern. Uh, and our law enforcement is also very engaged in this issue. The, the law that I was alluding earlier, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, directs the US law enforcement, the FBI specifically, uh, to investigate and hold to account to those engaging in transnational repression mm -hmm. against our fellow Americans in, in this country. I wanted to ask you a couple more questions ab about that because one of the things that is a, a research focus here at UT is um, looking at disinformation yep. and misinformation, but particularly maybe state-sponsored yep. disinformation and how we think about free speech and the protection of free speech in a case where we might have really powerful state-sponsored actors yeah. that are spreading um, disinformation through channels that, that might be clearly propaganda outlets, yeah, yes. but other places where that activity might be much more limited uh, or in, insidious or, or covert. Um, so in particular, because we're, we're here talking in part about First Amendment freedoms, yeah, yeah. How, how do you think we should think about um, free speech in an environment where disinformation has become pervasive? First of all, we have to make the distinction between the Chinese people and the Chinese regime. It's two separate things. And one thing that uh, former Secretary of State uh, Pompeo did was make that distinction every speech. He, he called out CCP, that's the source of the problem. If we may not have Xi Jinping in 10 years down the road if he survives that long. We still have the CCP, that's what makes the policy. So we have to focus on what, what are we targeting, what are we dealing with, not the people. The Chinese people also equally victim in this. So, so the language is very important uh, when we talk about uh, this regime. And then also, um, I, I think the public education is very important. Um, I have, uh, from my own experience, uh, speaking in academic institutions uh, here at home and abroad, uh, there are a lot of misinformation even uh, within the uh, Chinese uh, student community in these various campuses. 
they come to me after the event private saying, oh, I did not know about this. Um, this was riveting. Um, I was paying too much attention to the state propaganda. Uh, that is something very important. We need to be able to uh, educate the public. And one thing that I need to make it absolutely clear here, you know, even to this audience, this problem is not something that the United States government created. I, I'm sure that some of you are lawyers here. The United States only uh, called out uh, the regime committed genocide about six, seven times. It's not something common even in our State Department. In fact, the State Department lawyers don't like our government to casually uh, accuse a government, another government committing genocide, because it will compel us to act under uh, our treaty obligation. Uh, so, so it's not an easy decision. And the US government was compelled to do it because the facts are overwhelming. And, and the information that they had uh, publicly, uh, internally, were overwhelming. That compelled the United States government to call this regime out for the atrocities being committed. So the one thing that we need to think about is this is not something that we cooked up. Uh, the Chinese have this old video by a former chief of staff to uh, Secretary Colin Powell. That's their best weapon. They always use that to justify saying, oh, United States trying to use the Uyghur cause. No, you don't, United States does not have to use the Uyghur cause. Actually, the Uyghur problem has been a problem in the US government's approach or uh, engagement with China. Uh, not engagement, dialogue. That term is not the proper term to use. Uh, so when you talk to the Chinese, the Chinese really annoyed even to this day. You may recall uh, watching Secretary Blinken's exchange with his counterpart in Alaska. That's how this issue, how sensitive this issue is. So for, you need to stop listening to the Chinese saying that this is something United States uh, created, uh, and you need to pay, pay less attention to the whataboutism. Of course that we have problems as a country, but it's not the way that the Chinese uh, disinformation campaign has been trying to tell the world. This has been very effective in, in Europe, particularly. In some countries, they genuinely believe and this is even worse in the Muslim countries. Uh, not too long ago, there was a resolution at the UN uh, to debate on the uh, recent UN report. Uh, vast majority of the, the Muslim countries voted it down. Uh, that includes countries like Pakistan, all the stands in Central Asia that have uh, a, a connection to the Uyghur, uh, Uyghur people through history, cultural language. Uh, and then the other thing that we need to be able to do is to uh, um, it, 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 to encourage the students to have a free engagement. I don't think that it's fair, as I noted earlier. If I were a student today in anywhere, a uh, uh, law school or grad school, I should be annoyed. You know, academic freedom is, is very, very important for us. We should be able to speak and write our minds. This is how America is and how it works. So letting that kind of fear out of your mind is, is critically important. The United Work Department should not run how we operate in our academic institutions. Yeah, I should uh, here give uh, some credit to, um, the, to the two centers that sponsor the Asia Policy Program. The directors of, of the Clements and the Strauss Center are both here today. I will say that as we were sitting here, I realized that I did not uh, even discuss with either, uh, either of the center directors whether or not we should have an event uh, hosting you today. We didn't think twice about it. Um, no one asked us not to, and uh, I am very confident that had, uh, had we received any requests to cancel or change the event, uh, that would have made absolutely no difference. Um, so I'm, I'm personally very grateful to, to, to UT and to the Clements and Strauss Center yeah, and Thank for, you. for creating this, that kind of, of environment here to be able to have these conversations. Um, you, you mentioned two things, or am I? Okay, sorry, can you all hear me? Okay, is that better? All right, so. The nobody, important part was that I we know. <laughs> no one asked us to cancel this, nor we, or change it, nor would we have, uh, have uh, made any changes if we had received such a request. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful, because I do think that's an important role for institutions of higher education. Um, in today's environment to, to protect, actively protect that, that environment and place where students can ask questions and have these kinds of, of discussions, including on potentially controversial topics. Um, 
you touched on two things that I wanted to just briefly ask you if you wanted to add anything about um, before I will we'll turn it over to um, to our co-hosts for um, questions and discussion. One was was this issue of what just happened at the UN, and in particular. Yeah. Um, the fact that so many states with majority Muslim populations voted not to even have this discussion of what is happening in in Xinjiang. So I wanted to just ask you, um, one of our um, Strauss Center and APP affiliates, um, Dr. Rana Inboden, who couldn't be here today, um, works a lot on on China's role in the global human rights regime. So I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts or or wanted to add anything on that. And then the other issue that you you raised about... um, the distinction between the Chinese party state, the Communist Party, and the Chinese people. Um, you know, we've had a national conversation lately about um, bias and uh, prejudice against Asian Americans in particular. And so I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts on how to have these discussions in a way that ensures that it is, uh, you know, open, free, and fair debate, but that it doesn't create undue prejudice uh, against uh, Asian Americans or Muslim Americans. And if you, as a result of your experience, had any any thoughts you wanted to share on on that, and then I'll turn it over to Steve because I think my time is up. I'll I'll start in reverse order. I think the problem, uh, the uh, age, uh, hate, hatred towards Asians or others, has a lot to do with people who have access to megaphone to address these issues. I think this is a, this supposed to be a top-down approach. Um, in the same way, you know, um, in, in countries around the world, like for example, in, in, in Viktor Orban's Hungary, there's no Muslim problem, there's no Jewish problem. He uses that to, to make his point, uh, scaring people. That's one of the things that uh, authoritarian dictatorship do to rally support. So similarly, in our country, some politicians have been extremely reckless um, and uh, irresponsible, singling out a particular religious group, uh, singling out a particular ethnic group, linking it to other issues that should not be linked together. That need to stop. Uh, this has to be topped on. So I, 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 I'd like to hear uh, influential members of a political um, uh, community policy, community uh, legislative, uh, uh, in Congress in particular, and speak uh, uh, explicitly on these issues. And I'd like to see somebody in the White House to make a speech that this is no go. So I, you know, I will be affected myself. I look Asian. Who knows? Uh, people cannot come and check my ID to see, hey, um, are you Uyghur or are you Chinese? We'll not do that. Do that. So it will affect everybody's life. I took it very, very personal in April. I wrote about this in the book. The Muslim ban. Uh, you know, I also involved in the Guantanamo work, as I alluded. It's not because that I'm so interested in what these people were doing in Afghanistan. It's because that I'm interested in judicial independence. Like in this country, we will not have a judge, a prosecutor, and defense counsel all appointed by one person. That was George Bush then. Uh, that that's, that compelled many of the lawyers in in Washington, white shoe law firm environment to provide pro bono services. So this is this kind of issues has a, a direct effect to my worldview, my perception of American society. I think that many immigrants like myself share that concern. Even though that the Muslim ban does not directly apply to me, it does not uh, reflect well of our country. Um, also provides a talking point for the CCP. So yes, and then they come back and play that what about ism. It, it's, it's so harming. Uh, so we need to put our house in order if you wanted to be a global leader, if you wanted to uh, have people to appreciate, possibly adopt the values, the liberal values that we cherish. As for the other question, Sheena, it's very disturbing. I think that there's a, a, there's a, a deep-rooted problem at the UN. So when you look at, uh, this is also something what CCP has been doing effectively uh, through international organizations. Uh, Rush Doshi, the uh, current China director at the White House, written a book and he put out two terms, a blunt and build. It's one of the China's uh, blunting efforts, blunting of US influence effort while building their own influence. So that can be, that has been carried out three ways. One, they just do a bullying, uh, threatening, and then provide incentives, uh, economic incentives. In the case of Ukraine and that particular vote, the next day there will be a vote on Ukraine, uh, the annexation of Ukrainian territories by Putin. So they play that kind of things effectively. And where are we on this? We, where are we as a country? I don't think that the United States government has been doing enough. 
you know, as part of the, uh, you know, this is something I really like being a US government official. I can call out my own government. I think we are, <laughs> that's so much so for what about ism, right? So, <laughs> so think about this, you know, what, if we cannot get a countries like Mexico, India, to, uh, to vote with us, that shows that we, not been, we have not been effective. Uh, it took us a while to even convince Korea to vote yes in that resolution. Thank you. Nuri and Sheena, thank you so much. Uh, this has just been incredibly fascinating. Please join me in, in, in thanking them. And, I, and I'll emphasize, not, not just fascinating, but, uh, but incredibly important. So we're going to open this up for questions. We've got two mic runners. I already see hands popping up. Hold on. We have Alden here. And Colin, why don't you stand up so people can see you? They will run mics around. I'll call on people. I want to say two things that are going to make Nuri uncomfortable. Actually, he might applaud both of them, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, one is, if you have a copy of his book, you'd like him to sign it. I think you'd be more than happy to do that after we're, we're done here uh, today. And the second is, uh, as we open it up for questions, especially to you students, consistent with what Nuri said, please don't be afraid to ask what's on your mind, including if it's something that might challenge something he said today. That is the, the point of these types of affairs. And I feel like as the faculty director of the First Amendment Center, it's incumbent upon me to let you students know that you can ask questions that are, that are coming to your minds and we would like to hear them. So why don't we start right here in the front row as our first question. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, before I uh, get started, let me first uh, apologize on behalf of uh, my people and my country for the atrocities that are going on at this moment. And uh, I also want to say that, you know, um, I told this event to a lot of my friends. Um, a lot of them also suffer from this kind of uh, extra terrorist, uh, extra terrorist sorry, uh, extraterritorial kind of like um, threat, right? And they also feel, you know, like they're not safe to show up here in the case that they will be spotted by whatever, you know, surveillance that are still overseas. Uh, so, uh, but, but please understand that you, you do have a lot of, you know, Chinese allies uh, for, Thank especially you. within the overseas students community. Uh, so uh, I have, uh, my, my first question is, um, unfortunately in this day and age, uh, this, uh, this force on human rights and this uh, uh, neoliberal assumptions has um, kind of gone bankrupt in the Chinese context. So um, with that in mind, how do we come up with a more effective and provocative way to, uh, to narrate uh, the, the experience of the Uyghur people, right? Um, and the second question is, uh, to what extent do you think um, the Bush administration's uh, war on terror has been um, responsible and even complicit in giving China a cause to amp up its uh, security policies. And I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, Can uh, you uh, repeat the first one again? I'm sorry. The, the first one is, you know, how do we find a more effective way to uh, tell the Uyghur story outside of this human rights and uh, neoliberal narrative that has kind of gone bankrupt in China, right? Because in this day and age, if you tell a Chinese person that you don't have human rights, right, like uh, you should be mad about it, they wouldn't, right? In, in, in other words, uh, it would actually be counterproductive. Um, and my, my last question is, um, in your experience, um, to what extent do you think that uh, the, the, the quote-unquote good German hypothesis stands for the colonial Han Chinese population in Xinjiang? Are there people who are not complicit in what's going on, or is it more of a, you know, um, as far as the Han population in Xinjiang goes, is it, are there, you know, people who are, um, you know, not innocent? Um, for your first question, um, uh, the, the, let me start with the terrorism, counterterrorism one. Uh, yes, I do believe that the United States government uh, has a responsibility uh, in the uh, specific. We have uh, Mr. Wolford sitting over there. We, again, good to see you. Um, in the Bush administration, uh, before that the designation of ETIM as a terrorist organization, the Chinese did not use that term to describe the Uyghur grievances. I don't think that the Bush administration foresee that was coming, uh, that it will be misused. But, and then in late 2020, uh, same Republican administration, Republican administration, specifically Mike Pompeo, revoked that designation. I think that helped, but it was too late. The damage was done. Uh, even to this day, China has always used uh, Sengu Shili, a, a fight against three forces, separatism, extremism, terrorism, as a justification. Um, just this past summer, Chinese ambassador to Washington, Qing Gang, 
was speaking at uh, uh, Aspen Security Forum, and that was his weapon uh, to justify the atrocities. Still ongoing. Um, how to change uh, Chinese people's mind? I think the, it's a little bit easier outside of China, but I don't hold my breath on people on the ground. Some of you may disagree. Uh, the, the fear that Xi Jinping regime has created in Chinese people cannot be understated. He put away his own party officials. We're talking about more than half a million people. Uh, business community has been targeted. Uh, if you read uh, Desmond Shams' book, uh, Red Bullet, the kid gives you an idea. Uh, they ask Jack Ma what has happened to him and his business. So, so I, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to predict uh, what, and based on what I'm seeing on social media, it could be a troll, but uh, people tend to, uh, from at least from the surface, agree with his policies because it, either by design or wittingly or unwittingly, the Chinese regime turning uh, Chinese people uh, to a very strong nationalist, building a strong nationalistic sentiment. And, and to the Chinese people, even for some fair-minded people, uh, Xi Jinping appeared to be doing something very good to achieve stability. But at the same time, Xi Jinping regime and other apologists were not telling that religious persecution, human rights abuses actually creates more instability. Uh, so that is something missing in China. I forgot the last one other question. Is that you? Why don't we go ahead and yeah. give some time? Why don't we go ahead and give some thing briefly sure. on, on yeah. this, which, is, which doesn't, isn't a complete answer to your last question, but I think speaks to it a bit. Um, I recently reviewed a, a book manuscript that hasn't come out yet, but one of the things that it looks at is the way that the Chinese state media presents coverage of Xinjiang and these incidents of violence that, that, ha, that occurred in a period through about 2014, 2016 yeah. that were used as justification for this collective repression project that really escalated in 2016, 2017. Um, and one of the things that the, the book empirically documents, that like you do a lot of really sophisticated statistical analysis, is the way in which the um, official media sort of strategically times the content and the type of coverage of these incidents. Um, in a way that really frames to the Han majority this problem as this is dangerous, it, these yeah. people are violent, and that that's been a decade or more long project of you know, very strategic media coverage to create a certain impression. And I know when I was a student in China, um, I went to Xinjiang um, and uh, had a lot of people say, well, wait, isn't it really dangerous? And, no, I didn't feel any any less safe there than anywhere yeah. than than the other places I went in China, um, but there I think that it's we should just be very careful to note that the perceptions of the Han majority have been pretty strategically um, manipulated, and uh, certain narratives have been presented for for a decade or more now um, in order to create some of these perceptions of of danger um, to justify this this re incredibly repressive response that from the outside, the international community has said is, is indiscriminate and unjustifiable. So one other thing that, you know, in a, in, in, instead of changing their approach, they're changing narrative. Even Xi Jinping said that we need to project lovable image of China. So they're trying to bury this under the sand, but it's not working. I don't know how much they can continue to do this. Okay, why don't we go, uh, we have two students up here sitting right next to each other. Give the mic to one of them and they can fight over it. <laughs> go ahead, thank you. Okay, so we have two questions. Uh, my first question was, what is being done to preserve the cultural heritage of the Uyghur people uh, in Xinjiang? And how do we rehabilitate their culture after this genocide is over? Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time. Um, could, could we hold on? Let, let's let him answer the one, and then it's hard as a speaker to hold like four questions in your mind at once. So go ahead and answer that, and then yeah. she can ask her question. Go ahead. So it, <laughs> uh, um, in my book, I um, cited uh, former um, or late uh, Washington Post columnist Fred Hyatt, who likened uh, the Chinese destruction of Uyghurs is everyday, uh, a crystal knocking every day in China. So that gives you an idea. So the, the, the Uyghur cultural sites, uh, specifically religious sites, have been converted into a theme park, some instances public toilet, some instances uh, a hotel. A Hilton was building, reportedly building a hotel on a former uh, cemetery, a site of a cemetery. So there's nothing, actually it's a destructive effort, it's still underway. 
Um, how do we preserve it? I think this is something that the Congress uh, need to look at. Uh, two things. One, start documentation. Eventually, this will be uh, something that somebody needs to be hold to account uh, through international law or uh, international tribunal. And then two, we need to, you know, some Uyghurs will hate to hear this, but uh, why do we have to worry about the museum now? So the U.S. government through a Smithsonian Institute maybe may, uh, should, should consider setting up an um, a, a, a exhibit or cultural preservation called Cultural Center in Washington or outside of Washington. That would be a really good way to do it. There's some, something similar in Turkey with the support of Turkish government, but we need to have something outside of Turkey, uh, Germany here. So that, that's something being discussed. I don't think that there's anything done in that, to that effect yet. Great. And then right next, there, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to travel here. Um, this was an incredibly informative discussion. Um, do you see any global cooperation efforts coming to fruition um, in the near future to address this, this genocide? Um, to date, uh, we have... Uh, over 150 countries, uh, state parties, in gen, uh, signed on to the Genocide Convention. Uh, nine uh, parliaments and governments, including our own, uh, give the atrocities proper name. That's a, that's a huge improvement, even though we're not at the number where we want it to be. Uh, that's one, one uh, area. And then the other area I think I'm very hopeful is the, uh, the, the effort to clean up global supply chain of uh, forced labor produced consumer products. United States government uh, just start implementing um, a very strong uh, legislation, perhaps arguably one of the strongest legal mandate that Congress has made uh, to address some of the lingering issues in our trade relationship with China. Uh, that will address some of the problems, not all of the problems. And the European Parliament is also considering to ban uh, Xinjiang imports. So that is also a very uh, big uh, development. We're also seeing uh, some countries uh, addressing the surveillance uh, issue, the, the Chinese tech companies, uh, looking into the investment aspect, uh, which is also happening in the United States. But politically, I don't think that we have done enough. Uh, this is, uh, you know, in positive note, that both the previous administration, current administration, have done a lot, but this genocide is still underway. Uh, we have a lot of opposition, specifically from the, the climate uh, activists. They don't even want the Biden administration to go hard on China on the human rights. There were a letter uh, by 40 organizations, most of it I never heard of, that means nothing. But uh, they are pressuring the, even Biden administration not to go hard on China, to achieve Chinese co cooperation in climate, on climate crisis. Uh, those of you uh, may, may already know this, it's not how it, how it works in China. Uh, CCP leadership does what is good for them, good for the party, not because of uh, our special envoy's uh, particular position. Now, why don't we go right here, second row. Um, so I've been working in um, like activism around this for a while, and something that's been really frustrating for me is seeing that um, while American like diplomats um, are like very ready to denounce the genocide that's happening, um, as far as I'm aware, like the diaspora community in the United States has been basically neglected by the U.S. government. Like there's still an issue of like statelessness. Um, people are like stuck in like really long visa lines, and there's like the issue of like all of these people who are basically stateless in like Turkey who are who have who have credible fear of deportation, who the United States like isn't really doing anything to help. So do you see um, any kind of, are you hopeful for the future of America like helping uh, Uyghur refugees who are like already on the outside or is this, do you, do you think that the posturing stuff is just gonna continue? Uh, we may see uh, some movement, uh, movement in the US Congress. Uh, there have been a, a discussion to put in place or pass a legislation for special immigration status for Uyghur refugees, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, Egyptian government had uh, sent back a, a large number of Uyghurs back to China. Saudis are doing the same thing. Uh, the Central Asia has a horrific history, uh, track record. And now we have a large Uyghur refugee community in Turkey. So some members of Congress is already uh, on this. On the administrative side, uh, uh, the Uyghur activists have been effective. Uh, lobbying the Biden administration to speed up the asylum uh, adjudication process. So we're seeing some Uyghur asylum applicants whose case has been backlogged for a number of years. We're talking about since 2014. 
now being scheduled. So we've, we've seen some positive, and then Sweden uh, in Europe uh, offered blanket uh, immigration status to Uyghur refugees. Germany made a pledge that no Uyghur will be sent back to China. So there's some also, uh, there's a very active group of MEPs in the European Parliament. They have been uh, very effective uh, raising public awareness, initiating. They were able to stop that comprehensive agreement in investment in China, this CAI, uh, mainly because of China's treatment of the Uyghurs. How about right here in the middle in the intramural track meet shirt? Yeah, that's you. Yeah. Hello. So I'm really interested in your personal experience. So you said that you're originally from Kashgar, right? Um, how was it like growing up? Were you required to uh, learn to speak Mandarin? And also because uh, a lot of my um, relatives from my dad's side also, they live in Xinjiang, in eastern, eastern Xinjiang. And I'm just really interested in this Han Chinese ver uh, and Uyghur um, the interactions. How, how was that back in the days and how do you think it is today? The political pressure has always been there. Um, I wrote about this actually extensively in my book. Um, I, I lived through a, actually what some Uyghurs called the golden, golden period, uh, specifically in the 1980s. Um, I attended a high school, uh, Uyghur high school in Kashgar, in the heart of Kashgar. And my, uh, the university campus I grew up it's called Kashgar uh, Teachers College, where they specifically train Uyghur teachers, uh, educators in Uyghur language. I also grew up in a city where the Uyghur museums, uh, the museums, uh, cultural centers rebuilt. Uh, even in one instance, uh, government carved out a piece of land in a, a Chinese elementary school to build a mausoleum for uh, one of the most influential uh, Turkic scholar which still exists today. I also witnessed while I was uh, growing up in Kashgar the establishment of Uyghur Publishing House, which is the only uh, Uyghur language specific publishing house in the world. Uh, and now their editors are in the concentration camp. So yes, I've seen it. Uh, so, so if I were a Chinese official, would look at that period, no violence, no uh, public resentment, organized through, expressed through protests, everyone was able to uh, go about with their life, specifically the cultural life and the religious life. Uh, actually, they built a lot of mosques during that period. Uh, so there's something that Chinese government officials, policymakers, if they wanted to find a soft landing, uh, that period is something that they should look at. Okay, how about uh, up at the top in the pink shirt? Sorry, Colin, you're having to do all the running. Uh, my name is Hasib Abdullah, a resident here in Austin. Um, have there been uh, outreach efforts? Well, you mentioned Christians and also Tibet and the Buddhist um, to have a more collective uh, effort in uh, this effort to uh, stop the discrimination against religion, it seems, in general in China. Thank you. The religion, uh, religious groups um, uh, have been perceived um, two ways. One, uh, your strong religious identity uh, is, is actually seen as a sign of disloyalty to the party, to the state. And as I alluded earlier, uh, your religious practices uh, is also perceived as a potential threat to the state. Uh, when you look at some of the traditional Chinese uh, religious practices, you don't see that much, but this has been mostly targeted in the Catholic community in, in China and the Uyghurs, specifically the Uyghurs. Um, and I don't think that this is going to be uh, any better. Uh, by listening to Xi Jinping's speech, recent one and previous one, they are very, very adamant about protecting the Chinese uh, Communist Party ideology, now known as Xi Jinping thoughts. So they're also engaging in very active rewriting process in which they are rewriting uh, both uh, scripts in Quran and Bible. There is a cynicization process. So I'm afraid that they will, uh, will not back down because they see this as a real national security threat. How about here, uh, Michael Churgan? 
about midway up with the mask on. There, he's waving for you. Hi, the commission you chair has criticized the Department of Homeland Security about its deportation policy. And at one point, the commission was involved with training of immigration judges to try to make them sensitive to the whole issue of uh, religious freedom and so forth. Is the commission still involved with the training of immigration judges and people in the Department of Homeland Security? I am not aware of it. I joined the commission in May 2020, but since I joined the commission, we have been uh, focusing a, a specifically few countries, uh, India, China, and now Nigeria, uh, because of the ongoing religious and religious persecution. In addition to that, we have been also addressing global justice and accountability, humanitarian crisis, how we can be a better assistant to a vulnerable uh, religious community in Afghanistan, specifically the Hazara community. Uh, and also we have been um, focusing uh, on how, really, uh, how a, a, rel a religious community been subject to uh, enslavement in a global supply chain. When you look around uh, specifically in China, uh, now we're hearing uh, some uh, news that Tibetan people have also been subject to forced labor practices. Uh, we've also been uh, expanding our work to see how technology has been used in religious persecution. So uh, the issue that you, uh, you raised uh, may not be something, or may have been something that was uh, done uh, before I joined the commission. I'm not fully aware of it. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Let's make Alden run a little bit. How about right there in the, in the brown hoodie? Um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, what you have done about uh, people evacuating from Afghanistan, especially recently. And my question is because I have lived in Pakistan for uh, almost more than 20 years. And one of the reasons which I have heard or the excuses on behalf of the Chinese government is, first of all, that this propaganda is initiated by the American government. And secondly, they said to counter this, uh, that America hasn't been silent about atrocities happening to Muslims in other countries. So they said that that's why this is a propaganda and that they are not talking about atrocities happening in other countries. So how would you counter that argument? Thank you. I don't think that that question, just did you understand the question? How would you counter the argument that um, the United States is sort of selective in its, and, and therefore maybe hypocritical in uh, advocacy for the Uyghurs because they've been silent on other cases where Muslims might have been persecuted? Was that, is that a correct restatement yeah, yeah. of the question? Um, so this is kind of what about it? How, yeah. do you, how do you counter that? Okay, I, I, I think, you know, the, I can speak only for the agency that I represent. I think that we have, we cover 20, uh, close to 29 countries, give and take, you know, depending on the circumstances each year. We are not fully in agreement with the U.S. government's broader policy approach. Um, I named two countries, for example. We disagree with the way that the, the human rights abuses, atrocities in India, uh, in Nigeria, for example. We should call them out uh, for those uh, actions. India, in the case of India, for example, the, um, this country not too long ago had a Muslim president. Today, in Indian society, a Hindu woman cannot marry a Muslim man. Uh, it can be criminalized. So, and that's the country that we have a very close partnership with in Indo-Pacific affairs. So how do you address it? I think that we should, give, we should call them out. Um, uh, because we are an independent uh, government agency, we can... Uh, make that kind of policy recommendation. That's what we do uh, statutorily, uh, pro provide policy advice to the Secretary of State, uh, President, and Congress. And those are the areas that we are, are laser-focused. Uh, you may see a, a different approach. The same thing with Pakistan, for example. We call them out. Uh, and we also uh, focus on Saudi Arabia. And some people in the uh, diplomatic community don't like it. But, you know, uh, our commission has this... Uh, uh, um, um, public position, we need to be and continue to be a truth teller. So we, we do what we are legislatively mandated to do. 
So I can't speak for the State Department, but this is our position. Thank you. Thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry for those of you that we didn't get to.